If you have diverticulosis, you may face a diverticular bleed. Let's discuss this common reason for GI bleeding. Diverticular bleeds occur because blood vessels of the colon must pass through its muscular wall to nourish the inner lining of the colon. These gaps in the muscular wall create a weak spot, which allows the mucosa of the colon to herniate through, and this causes a diverticula. Of course, everybody has these gaps in the muscle wall, but only a portion of people have diverticula. You can get diverticulosis for genetic reasons predominantly. Smoking, obesity, and diet are probably also risk factors we don't know for sure, but why does a diverticular bleed occur? Because there's a lot of shearing stress on the blood vessels that's passing through and it over time thins and eventually ruptures. It's thought that diverticular bleeds more often occur on the right side of the colon because it is thinner walled and the diverticular on the side characteristically form a wider dome, which is weaker in its integrity. That leads to more shear stress and therefore more diverticular bleeds. Hearing this explanation, let's keep perspective on a few facts. First, diverticular bleeds are actually relatively uncommon. It's just that diverticulosis is so common that diverticular bleeds end up being the most common reason that a person is admitted to the hospital with lower gastrointestinal bleeding. However, if you just had a colonoscopy and you learn that you have diverticulosis, your chances of having a diverticular bleed over the next year are about one in 500 patients like yourself. And over the next decade, really still less than 10% of patients will suffer a diverticular bleed. So they remain uncommon and most people with diverticulosis will actually never suffer from it. Next, most diverticular bleeds are self-limited. They stop on their own. And by the time that you're actually seeing the blood come out, it might be that the bleeding already stopped. Think of it this way. Blood has to travel all the way from the right side of your colon out to your anus. And while blood is cathartic and it's going to make your colon propulse and jet out that blood much more quickly than you would otherwise, it still takes time. And you'll notice that you're often passing clots. And so if clots could form, then that means clots could form also at the site of the diverticula. So the bleeding may have actually already stopped. It remains important to make a decision to go to the ER because the amount of blood that you can lose can be very severe and you're going to need to be carefully evaluated and resuscitated. Next, inflammation is not a typical reason for a diverticular bleed. Inflammation is diverticulitis and it's rare that the two happen together. So diverticulosis generally has no inflammation which means with it there's no pain. So it's characterized by painless bleeding and this contrasts other reasons for large lower gastrointestinal bleeding, like ischemic colitis or an infectious colitis. These cause pain because there's inflammation. Now remember, blood stimulates your colon. It wants to get that blood out and that's gonna make you feel bloated and spastic. So it's not totally comfortable, but that is a distinct thing from pain and an important distinction to be made in the emergency room. And because these bleeds are so characteristic and they can be very well defined just based on the clinical history, there's often very little reason for a diagnostic workup. If you're not having pain and fever, there's really not much reason to start thinking about infectious stool studies. And if you're not having ongoing active bleeding, then you probably don't need a CT angiogram. And since the bleed of inflammatory bowel disease and colon cancer happens in a very different way, imaging is similarly not really that needed much of the time. What is important is to check blood levels resuscitate, get a person feeling better with fluids, and if they need it, a blood transfusion. In the emergency room, a CT angiogram is often performed when a patient reports that they almost passed out. But if a patient almost passes out when they're actually passing stool, this may be due to a vagal maneuver. The vagal tone that happens when you have a large bowel movement will slow your heart and make a person who's already depleted of blood now pass out but it doesn't necessarily signify that the patient has re-bled. And it can be difficult to distinguish this, and that's where there needs to be a careful assessment. Not every patient needs a CT angiogram when they're presenting with a diverticular bleed. To help clarify this issue, it can often be helpful to perform a bowel cleanse just as we would ahead of a colonoscopy. By ridding the colon of old blood, we can help distinguish ongoing fresh bleeding, and this determines whether a patient may ultimately need a colonoscopy or other more aggressive interventions. If the patient is determined to have persistent bleeding, then a team approach between gastroenterology and interventional radiology is helpful to control the bleeding. 
interventional radiologists can gain access to the patient's arteries and stop the bleeding vessel. Gastroenterologists can perform a colonoscopy and find the culprit diverticula and then have techniques to stop that bleeding. It can be helpful to place a clip directly on the blood vessel that's bleeding or to perform a procedure called banding. In this technique, we actually suck the diverticula up and invert it and then place a band-like device to cinch it off. Prepping for a colonoscopy while you're bleeding is a daunting challenge, but I have met the rare patient ready to relive their college frat day glory by accepting the power hour challenge of a four liter jug of go lightly. I've also given it the old college try and attempted a colonoscopy with minimal prep, a technique that some advocate for with the idea that fresh blood will distinguish itself. I have found that this doesn't really work that well and I will use this moment to extend my thanks and my apology to those nurses who went forth on that good fight with me. I think there's two good ways to approach this. First is the patient who you don't think has persistent bleeding and you want to prove it by cleaning out their colon. They can have a leisurely prep that rids their colon of old blood and once they produce brown stool again, they can stop the prep because the ultimate goal is not to proceed with a colonoscopy. For the patient that looks like they're having persistent bleeding and needs an intervention because they're failing to respond to resuscitation the way we would like, that patient may do best with a large volume enema, a liter of fluid that they get to slosh around in their belly by turning to and fro in the bed. Repeating that a couple of times can get them ready for a decent prep and a good colonoscopy with an effective intervention. Ultimately, the humbling fact is that a colonoscopy is not very effective for stopping a diverticular bleed. So much of the time, it'll actually have stopped on its own. Those times that it persists, we only find a bleed about half the time. And then when we intervene upon it, only about half the time does that intervention prove effective and durable. So what sometimes occurs is that a patient is recurrent diverticular bleeding. That patient needs to have consideration to go to surgery and have that disease portion of the colon resected. I hope that you found this information about diverticular bleeds helpful. If you have more questions, comment below. Thank you for watching and be safe.